Hi everybody who's watching. Um, I'm Liz Dawes Dreising and this is Sarah Shea, my colleague at Project Zero at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. We are very excited to be hosting a special hangout today with Paul Salapek and Aziz Komorodov, his recent working guard in Uzbekistan. And joining us, we have a host of educators. Many of these educators are part of the Out of Eden Learn community, which um, we run from here at Project Zero. We also have colleagues from the Pulitzer Center of Crisis Reporting, and on screen, educators affiliated with National Geographic. And so we welcome all educators and students who are listening, and we really look forward to young people in particular having a chance <coughs> to ask Paul and Aziz questions directly. Um, we want to get very quickly to questions, but I want to give a shout out to the educators who are here. Please bear with us as educators come and go a bit. We can see some have dropped off. One poor educator is undergoing a fire drill as we speak and hopes to join us. Um, that would be Becky Root from Colorado, who we hope to see soon. We have Natalie Belli with, Belli with her fifth graders from Marblehead, Massachusetts in the USA. We have Rob Martin, who is a sixth grade teacher in Chennai, India. Um, we have Tracy Crowley and Laurie Mason um, from the field school watching because they're having technical issues, um, but they are actively participating from behind the screen. We have Dan Valesco and um, Dana Gilmore, um, hopefully joining us partway through, um, also from Illinois. We have Kristen Tarnas and Matt Piercy, who have got up very early. It's 5 a.m. in Hawaii right now, so thank you for making that special effort. We have Poppy um, Nikopoulou, hope I've got that right, Poppy, from Piraeus in Greece. Um, it's evening there, so her students aren't with us, and she's a kindergarten teacher. And we have Tabitha O'Donnell, a seventh grade teacher from Hobie Sound in Florida, USA. So thanks, everybody, for joining. And with that, uh, Paul and Aziz, could I turn it over to you to give us a brief update on, on what's been happening recently on the walk? Well, Aziz and I are, are talking to you all from one of the Silk Road cities in the country of Uzbekistan. And do let us know if you can't hear us. Um, we are sitting far away from the screen. You can catch us both, uh, but we can get closer if we need to. Um, we're, we're about halfway, actually more than halfway, through Uzbekistan. It's a, it's a, a fairly big country in Central Asia um, that's very famous in history, very deep culture, as a crossroads of civilizations. And as, as you all probably know, um, Silk Road is an important uh, pioneering um, artifact of a global history of connecting cultures through trade. And so Aziz and I are about, oh... 700 miles or about 1,300 kilometers through Uzbekistan. And I think it's safe to, to reveal our location actually in this situation. So we're in the city of Bukhara. Uh, we just walked through the city of Kiva and we're on our way to another very fabled, very famous Silk Road city called Samarkand. And is there anything to add about our location? Yeah, Bukhara located uh, in between two deserts. It is uh, Kizilkum Desert on the north, Karakum Desert on the south. It is ancient city, 2,500 years old. Uh, city always was a capital for different empires, different states in its period of uh, history. And nowadays it is just, uh, it's not the capital anymore, but one of the ancient city in Uzbekistan. I think without further ado, can we jump into check because we have, as I said, over a hundred ready to go and we're never going to get through them all. Um, so I, I'm wondering, um, Rob, would you like to go first and ask a question um, from, from your students? Don't forget to unmute. Sure, can you hear me? Yes. You yes. can. Yes, hi Paul, uh, thanks for doing this. Uh, here's a question from one of my students. How do you feel you can help other countries and their citizens in your role as a writer and an explorer? Okay. Um, 
Rob, I, I, you broke up a little bit. Could you, could you repeat one more time? I'm sorry. Sure, I'll repeat that. How do you feel you can help other countries and their citizens in your role as a writer and an explorer? Um, you know, my uh, purpose, my mission with this project is storytelling. So that's, that would be my simple answer, is that by telling other people's stories, uh, it shows how people around the world have similar concerns, similar loves, similar passions, and that we are all truly one big family. Um, and so the Out of Eden Walk project tries to give people a voice who normally wouldn't uh, be heard by mass media, by big newspapers or TV stations. Um, and more and more, um, we're trying to incorporate the voices of the people I meet along the way, including those of Aziz. So communication, I think, it, you know, I'm not setting out to, to change the world, you know, to change countries, but it's a small way to show that just talking to each other, conversing to each other and listening to each other is a good way to uh, um, get along and problem solve together as we move through the challenges of this new century. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great, Poppy, would you like to go next? On my own? Yeah. Yeah? Yes. Hi, Paul. I'm, I'm very happy to join this Hangout, Google Hangout with you. I have a question for you, not for my students. Um, being raised in Mexico, I would like to ask you if you feel um, a little bit sensitive about crossing borders and uh, to what ex extent have this uh, childhood experience influenced, helped you or challenged you to find connections between your life and the lives of the people that you meet on uh, the Out of Eden Walk? Well, Poppy, nice, nice to finally meet you. Uh, a really excellent question, one that, that goes, that, that cuts like a border through a lot of my work on this project. I have crossed multiple borders, I think 11 or 12 national borders so far. All of them are different. Um, borders are imaginary, they're not real, um, but they are also very concrete. So there's this strangeness about borders and people who live on borders can, can talk to this about how they both divide, but being edges, they also stitch together people too. Um, mm -hmm. I'm very sensitive about borders, about migration. Um, I think crossing a border, an international border, when I was six into a very different culture from the one that I grew up in um, was an enormous gift that my parents gave me because it allowed me to feel comfortable as a child in different cultures and different languages and I think allowed me to do what I'm doing now, which is to basically um, walk through different cultures and, and try to understand them and, and listen. So. Um, Borders can be negative things. They can, they can be militarized. They can close off your passage. Um, but they can also be gateways to opening your mind to new experiences and, and new ways of thinking. The borders are an intriguing, they're, uh, you know, a fancy word would be a paradox. They're, they're, they're both good and bad at the same time. And you can look at it on the same day from a different angle and see both sides of borders, both their good and bad things. Aziz, you, 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 know, you were born and grew up in a country where borders have basically um, been drawn and then were not really important, but are important again. I mean, borders, you've seen borders suddenly appear in your life that were, yes. weren't important. Yes. Now they're, they're impossible sometimes. Yes. Uh, in the country where I grew up, that was the Soviet Union, there was no borders. Uh, I mean, the borders inside be between the former Soviet republics. But uh, after the Soviet Union collapsed, Uzbekistan got four borders with the neighborhood countries. But before we was crossing those borders without even uh, feeling that we crossed the border, it or the road uh, and uh, uh, picture 
outside the window was the similar, the view outside the window was similar. But nowadays it is very, very difficult, especially in our country, because we have some kind of uh, threat of uh, different uh, uh, terrorism attacks and uh, the time influence. So our borders is very, very secure at the moment. And that brings a problem to cross the borders. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Lee, for your answer. Thank you, Poppy. And thanks, Poppy. That was great. Um, Natalie, do one of your students have a question for Paul or even maybe Aziz? Yes. Go ahead. Nice and loud. Come on over here. Have you been to many? Wait, did you turn it off? Nope, you got it. Have you been to many schools? And if so, what have you noticed or appreciated about different learning styles? After school, do kids go to college, get married, or go to work? Wow, what a great question. And I think I'll, I'll, we should both take a turn at that. Yeah, you know, I, I have visited schools. Um, one universal is nobody likes homework. Um, but um, I think the what happens after school really varies country to country, and it depends on the economics. I, I walked through part of Georgia with a, with a young, young man who had just graduated from their version of high school. And Georgia has a pretty serious um, um, employment issue. And he was asking himself these very questions. What do I do with my education? You know, do I go to college or do I migrate? Do I leave Georgia to find work outside the country? And this is a, think about this, guys. This is a really serious question that probably some of you are lucky enough not to have to face, um, is that when you get out of school, if there's no work, what is the point of going to university? Because if you go to university and there's still no work, what do you do? Um, and so some people choose to leave. Um, and that's a story that I think uh, I'd like to write more about. You put your finger on it, it's a good story. But by and large, I think the, the schools that I've been in, whether they were in Africa, in the Middle East, in the Caucasus, and we still have yet to do a school visit here in Uzbekistan, um, I think, one thing unites all the kids that I talk to and I see is a tremendous enthusiasm to learn and to, and to try to uh, make their lives better through learning. I'm not making that up. I mean, that's actually, that energy is very real. Aziz, anything about schools in Uzbekistan? Well, I think the, just like in, the, in any other countries of the world, the kids, everywhere is the kids, they're also interesting in the same things which uh, other country kids interested well uh, actually my kids also they in school and they're really interested in studying school and uh, i remember when i was a kid sometimes it was boring i was saying well i don't want to do this but <laughs> my kids never say that looks like it is really in the breakfast kids are getting smarter than us maybe yeah. <laughs> We have, a, we have another question, if that's okay. What keeps you motivated to keep walking? Do you have to train for stamina? Okay. Yeah, that's another good question. I, I think the motivation comes from um, my work. You know, the walk is my work. Um, as, as strange as it sounds, it's sort of what I wake up to in the morning. My office is the sky that I open my eyes to, or the desert that I look around at, or the village um, that I have a cup of chai tea in the morning. That's where I work. My, my workplace is the trail. My workplace is the road. And my workplace is the mountain pass that I have to walk over. And the beauty, the thing that keeps me motivated is that it is different every single day. It is an office that changes every single morning that I open my eyes so that it's impossible to get bored. And there are new challenges and new people to meet. And the people that I meet along that trail are the people who, whether they realize it or not, with just a hello um, or an interesting conversation, they give me the energy to keep going. Um, training, uh, you know, it's you sort of, when you're, when you're on a long foot journey like this, you're pretty much always training, you're always in shape. Um, fortunately, it's not a big radical sport. It's not an extreme sport. It's kind of easy on the body. So, um, you know, we've been here, I've been, you know, about a week. 
I'll probably got a little bit out of shape. Um, and so I'll feel the first day, but I think muscle memory will kick in pretty soon. And as you've gotten really good, I commend you um, from our first days together. As you've really gotten in great shape. Great. I'd like to um, in interject a question that was sent to us um, ahead of time. And these, this question comes from fifth grade students from kindergarten starter school in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. And the question is, and it is to Paul, if you're in a situation in which you have to pass an ocean or any form of water resource, resource which is too huge to walk around, what will you possibly do because your journey is all about walking? Mm. Great question. Um, and it's, it's already happened. Uh, um, it, uh, I ran into a big body of water within the first few months of my journey called the Red Sea, which is sort of down in, you know, in your region, the Middle East. And I had to stop and in a country called Djibouti and wait for weeks to find a ship. So I take a ship. So I allow myself to travel over the ocean in a ship. Uh, if I run into a big body of water, I don't take airplanes. Um, and so far I've only had to do it, um, I've actually had to do it three times. The Red Sea, the Mediterranean, when I had to walk around, get around Syria because of the civil war, and then across the Caspian to get out of the Caucasus into Central Asia. So I take boats. I'll share one anecdote about that with you guys. Um, there's, a, there's a famous geneticist, a guy who studies human origins, um, and he was asking himself, how did ancient humans and the people that I'm following handle this problem? Um, and what he found is that there's this old species called the Neanderthals, who are our ancient cousins who are older than we. When they walked to a beach, they stopped and scratched their heads. They looked left and right, shrugged their shoulders, and turned around and went back inland. But something about Homo sapiens, we didn't stop. We, we got the idea of floating a log and we paddled out into the sea and disappeared. And we did it over and over and over again. And imagine this happening for hundreds or thousands of years. People disappear into the sea and they don't come back. You don't know what happens to them. And we still did it. And that's how we got across big bodies of water through sheer imagination, through this spark of exploration. And this geneticist, uh, Svante Pavo, said it basically proves that we're crazy. I'm old enough. <laughs> anyway, that was great. Um, so, Tabitha, did you want to invite um, a student or two to come and ask a question? Yes, um, we have um, a question for Paul and also a question for Aziz. And hi, everybody. Um, go ahead. Okay, hi, Paul. Um, we are a group of sixth and seventh graders from Florida. A couple questions for you. The first one is, if you could make a mantra to describe your journey, what would it be? What would describe me is stars can't shine without darkness because you can't be great without learning from hardships. Oh, that's a great one. Maybe I'll borrow yours. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, you know, I've, I've, I've been asked this by, by even fellow writers, you know, and I have to say again, it goes back to storytelling. This is what I do and I love, and it's what keeps the out of Eden walk going. Um, is I, I like to quote another writer. Um, I quote Barry Lopez, um, who wrote, um, and Barry Lopez is a great essayist. You guys should look him up and, and read some of his books. Um, I would suggest a short story collection called Winter Count. Um, but in that book, he says, all that holds us together are stories, stories and compassion. And I think that truly is a mantra, one of many, but a main one that keeps me going. Aziz, do you have any special life um, motto or idea that keeps you going? Well, uh, as a... Former Soviet Union uh, citizen uh, in our country, in Soviet Union, the Robinson Crusoe uh, was very popular. The Daniel Defoe story about Robinson Crusoe, and every Soviet student, almost every Soviet student, read that book. It is very interesting book, and 
one of the first book which uh, uh, kids read in their life, uh, especially so the kids. And uh, sometimes it comes some uh, examples from that uh, book comes uh, we, we experienced that during our trial because uh, he was he had to do everything himself he was alone nobody helped him until that Friday man right. showed up so mm -hmm. sometimes uh, I remember his experience during our trail it is quite interesting Pure perseverance and using the best tool you have which is yes. your brain to yes. get through problems yes um, we have one more question for Aziz. Um, Aziz, what is your favorite story or funniest moment about traveling with Paul? So far, I fall down from Dunkin'. <laughs> I think that that was really funny because not not much fun we have, especially under the sun. It is always uh, tough and difficult to walk under the heat, but. Uh, on the day when I fall down from a donkey and Paul watch it from behind, that was really funny. I agree. <laughs> you can tell more about it. <laughs> Thank you. Aziz, did you hurt yourself? Are you okay? <laughs> yeah. That was nothing, nothing hurt. It. I was okay. Okay, you guys. Matt, um, we can't see you on video, but if you can turn your audio on, could, do you want to ask a question from your students in Hawaii? Yes, please. Hey, good morning. Aloha, Paul and Aziz. Aloha. Hello. Oh, good. Question is, uh, going back, Paul, to what you were saying about compassion, uh, is there any one interchange with another human being or anything that you've seen in particular that's really um, struck a chord of compassion for you? Yeah, I think, you know, Matt, there have been so, so many. I mean, they're um, the, the everyday, ordinarily, ordinary, so-called ordinary um, tones of compassion that come with somebody sharing a cup of water from a well, um, uh, somebody sharing a smile at a difficult border crossing, uh, somebody taking your hand uh, during a difficult passage through the mountains. Um, those are almost as much cherished as uh, more dramatic instances that I can cite you, like um, uh, coming across big, big tides of refugees out of Syria, where you see thousands of people spilling in to a new country with only the clothes they have on their backs, and their bewilderment, and their, their fear, and their shock at having been stampeded out of their homes just literally minutes before. You can see their, their city within sight, and it's being attacked by, by uh, fighters. And yet, see how these people are received by villagers on the opposite side of a border. And, you know, Poppy just mentioned this border paradox, where they automatically open their doors and bring up food and blankets. Um, that is very affirming. And I think it goes to one of the great lessons for me about this project is not to have fear, not to be afraid of the other, not to be afraid of somebody else um, who looks different than you or talks differently. Um, it's been a lesson over and over. Compassion erodes fear. Compassion makes fear subside. Beautiful. Thanks so much. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. That was a great question. So we have another question that's been sent in by an educator um, in Middleburg, Virginia, of fourth and fifth grade students, Katie Brennan. Her students and her are watching now. Um, Paul, will you eventually write a book of your travel? Yeah, you know, my book editor is asking me the same question. <laughs> um, yes, I'm behind schedule on that. Um, I'm working on the first book. Um, I actually hope to write two or three books because it's such a long journey. But I've got most of a book in my backpack, and one of the plans is to hopefully wrap it up this winter. I promise you, Random House. Yes. <laughs> That's great. That's exciting. And maybe we'll, we'll um, stick in another question. This time it's from Jason McNeely's um, class in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Um, 
This is a very general question, but what's the most challenging problem you faced between Ethiopia and Uzbekistan? Wow. Wow. Um, well, I mean, that, can I give a range of answers? I hate to be, I don't mean to be evasive because there are whole scales of problems as there are scales of joy ranging from loneliness, kind of a, an existential problem to um, the visas of getting, getting permissions to walk um, where the ancestors walked. And it comes again, bumping up against borders and, and the border which, which you cannot see turns into a wall. Um, that has provided me with opportunities of, to do to, for major me and my colleagues at National Geographic, it's created a lot of work to to problem solve through this. Um, weather can sometimes be a problem. Um, there have been some pretty cold um, days on the trail in the Caucasus. There have been Aziz and I have been through some extremely hot days in the Kizilkum, the Red Desert uh, that we just walked through. Um, so yeah, the, you know, the, the journey is not without its, its challenges. Um, I don't know about you, but you know, when I'm walking and I get into those situations, I, I sort of retreat into a space in my mind, um, almost like a, a cave. Uh, we were walking in the desert a few days ago and it was, it was really, really hot. And I remember having a hat on and there's a space that I go to the, the, the landscape was molten. It was like the desert was on fire, wavering in heat waves from the sun. And there's kind of a place that I retreat into that's wet and damp inside my skull, uh, like, a, like, a, like a, an oasis. And it's a strange ability and, and a wonderful one to kind of distance yourself from your suffering um, and kind of go into a trance-like state in these times and, and get through these hardships. That's great. Thank you. Um, so a question for unmuted me. Unmuted me. A question for um, Aziz from Becky Roots, fourth and fifth grade class in Colorado. What is the strangest question Paul has asked you? Well, it's, uh, I need to think about. I need to. Memorize what was the strange, yeah. Probably there are a lot of them. <laughs> Always asking Aziz questions. Well, you see, uh, there, there might be every question might be a strange question, but good, good this, is, this, this is uh, my, um, that's why I'm here. I need to take this question and resolve it. So no strange questions for me. Uh, all the questions need to find the solution. So we have to get it done. In, in the middle of the Kizil Kum, I would ask him, Marojna? Uh -huh. But it's just a funny question. Yeah, it's not the strange, it's just a funny, it's just a joke. <laughs> That's Russian Mar for Marojna ice cream. Marojna means uh, ice cream. Oh. <laughs> well, it's great to know that you guys take ice cream breaks too. <laughs> when there is enough. <laughs> or try to. <laughs> so, and, um, we were also wondering, um, actually, this, yes, this is from Kristen Tarn. Um, I believe she hasn't been able to join from Hawaii this morning, but her students will watch this later. And, um, Kristen's students who are fifth graders asked um, Aziz, how did you meet Paul and how did you end up walking with him? Well, that was uh, over the internet. I uh, promote myself on one of the websites and uh, it is almost a year how we started to contact. Paul wrote me. Uh, it was uh, quite interesting to me. Uh, I replied back, but I wasn't sure that Paul will receive his visa. But when he got his visa, we start to make the all arrangements. So that was over the internet. And, and why did you want to walk with Paul? Excuse me? And why did you decide you wanted to walk with Paul? Okay, uh, because uh, this chance 
probably will count only once in your life and uh, it is quite interesting for me as well this is a challenge and uh, uh, second of all uh, I don't know any other man in my country who did it who made it before um, so it, it was very interesting to me to be with Paul and uh, Walt over Uzbekistan I think you probably wake up every morning and still ask yourself, why am I doing this? <laughs> <laughs> and I think so far, am I right in thinking, Aziz, that you've already walked 1,300 kilometers with Paul? That's correct. You, you have walked 1,300 kilometers. Yes, already. Yeah. yeah. That's a lot of walking. Yeah. <laughs> a lot. I'm going to switch to a question that I think is on uh, many students' minds, actually. So uh, I'm going to um, ask it on behalf, um, again, of um, the sixth grade class in North Carolina. And it can be for either of you. Have you encountered a dangerous bug or animal? Was it venomous? And have you been sick along the way? Wild animals? Bugs, insects, anything? Well we see them we saw many of them but uh, thanks God knock on wood they didn't bite us well and I always told Paul if they will bite us I will bite them back <laughs> yeah we've lost audio a little bit with you um, can you hear us Okay. Yeah. We gotcha. What about you, Paul? Have you have you encountered anything venomous along the way? You mean besides certain editors? <laughs> <laughs> no, fortunately, no. Um, you know, there were there were wolves in Turkey. We ran we ran into wolves in Turkey, and we also ran into wolves in Kazakhstan. But wolves leave you alone. Wolves have a bad reputation that's not merited, and they basically, they're curious and they come close and they may circle you, but they don't, they don't bother you. So, if, you know, fortunately, you know, there were some scorpions in Africa and, and whatnot, but uh, nothing serious. Great. Um, here. I'm going to ask a question that's come into us while we've been on air, and then, um, uh, Tabitha and Natalie, if you want to get ready with another student, I think we'd all love to hear another student voice. Um, so, Paul, if you had one, or Aziz, actually, if you had one word to describe what you feel when you are walking, what would it be? It's from Mike McFarland's oh, class. Yeah. Thank you. Well, uh, so far we walk in the remote area of our country, of Uzbekistan, and uh, that area not much pop inhabited, populated with people. Uh, you feel you are part of the nature. You really feel that because all what you see uh, most of the time, uh, it is wild nature, sands, horizon, stars, uh, moon, and uh, you evaluate this beauty uh, once more again and again and uh, you just uh, understand how beautiful is our world our nature and uh, it is just fantastic i i need two words at home lost the voice again. yeah we've lost audio do you want yes yes yeah. yeah, so I was just going to say, could you just say a little bit more by what you mean by at home, Paul? Well, I thought we were limited to one word. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, basically, um, I just feel uh, a sense of calm and a sense of belonging uh, and a sense of uh, centeredness. Maybe that's an overused word, but a sense of um, peace, a sense that that's where I should be. 
Um, so I'll do, we'll do one more question from, that's come in and then we'll move to the students. So what is it that makes you laugh, especially during the tough times? And this is from Holly Scott's fifth grade class in Danville, California. What is it that makes you laugh, especially during the tough times? Disease, you want to go first? Well, I think uh, donkeys. Sometimes they attack attacked by the other donkeys. <laughs> And this is funny. I never have seen them a lot. In Uzbekistan, you can see uh, donkeys everywhere, but uh, you didn't know much about their life. What happened? When you walk with your donkey and uh, you approaching the other donkey, so that donkey, you, you, you can see how it, it prepared to talk to your donkey. And when you get closer, <laughs> that donkey... <laughs> Uh, try to attack, or at least they talk. They gave the voice, that uh, typical uh, Duncan voice, and uh, what we call it, roar. Yeah, they yeah. bark. You know, they, yeah. they roar at each other. Yeah, roar each other, and this is funny. You you, you don't know what they want, but uh, most of the time the the Duncan stays quiet. But when they come close to each other, they kind of start to talk and uh, trying to fight it is really funny no i, I agree I and sometimes we sorry Go ahead. sometimes we see uh, the donkey which didn't react and i say oh looks like intelligent donkey <laughs> <Good> behavior <laughs> animals animals are a source of great fun and uh and people of course i mean there have been times when you know we've been doubled over laughing so hard the way you do when you laugh so hard that you have to bend down and hold your knees. Um, it's just people are funny, mm -hmm. intentionally and unintentionally, and we're all so ridiculous. It's absurd. I mean, what we're doing on some one level is very ridiculous. <laughs> and to see people's reactions often can be very amusing. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you. And um, Natalie, did you have a student ready to go? Yes. You have been walking for almost three full years. How has your thinking changed? Mm, no, good question. Yeah, good one. You guys have got questions tonight. Um, because these are, I'm not, and I'm not joking, I'm not saying that, because these are questions that I'm wrestling with. I mean, think about it. You know, if you were walking year after year, changes to your mind would come slowly. But I sometimes stop and say, wow, how have I changed in the last year or two? Um, you know, I just think it's, I guess one, one important thing is I just feel more comfortable in the world. Um, I just feel um, I've always been able to move through uh, different parts of the world. That was my, my job as a, as a newspaper reporter. But now walking gives you a sense of confidence that you'll be okay no matter where you are. And I can't quite put my finger on why. I can give you fancy theories. But I think it's just a sense of I become more... I've become more calm, I hope, um, with where I am and what I am. It's just more peaceful. Great. Um, Tabitha, did you have a student question? Yes. Okay. Um, keeps you going, and do you ever feel like giving up and going home? Yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's another good one. Um, and uh, not yet. You know, I must say, um, I sort of talked a little earlier. I don't know if you guys were online when, when I answered that a little earlier. I don't want to use up too much time to answer it again. But basically, your, your second part of your question is, is uh, new information. No, I have not really felt so badly or so um, frustrated or so... You know, blocked along my way that I want to go home. On the contrary, I think more and more um, I feel that um, I am home, sort of no matter where I am. And uh, the, the walk has been one of the great, that's been one of the great gifts of the walk is to feel at home where you are. You know, the more, the more of the world that I see, guys, um, the more that I come to a deep 
satisfaction that it doesn't really matter what the backdrop is, whether it's forest or desert, whether it's uh, steeples or, or minarets, um, whether it's Russian that I'm hearing or Spanish or, or Isa. Uh, it's, it's people. I think I find my home in people. Uh, people that I meet are my home. I'm going to read out a question that's come to us from Becky Weeks' class in Boulder, Colorado. Um, I'm not sure if they're back from their fire drill, but they were supposed to be on screen. Um, do you ever feel that it's hard to connect with the local people you meet? And what do you do to make that easier? I think um, you've already said that you actually find it surprisingly easy to connect. But what do you do to kind of facilitate that, to, to make a connection with local people? who, when you walk into their village, they have no idea who you are or what you're doing there. Yeah, it's a good thing I'll also let Aziz talk because he's, he's experienced different subcultures within his own country. Uh, he can talk to that. But briefly, in, in, in a word, waiting, time. You know, I have the luxury by not driving or not flying to move slowly through people's lives. And that includes moving into people's lives, that crucial first contact where you're a stranger, I have luxury of waiting. So, you know, if people are a little shy, if people are a little um, wary, a little suspicious, I go sit under a tree and, uh, you know, have, have, a, have a little bit of water or look at a map and, and just take, give them time to act. Seems that Paul's cut off. All right, we'll just, um, we'll give him a minute or two to reconnect. And then um, we were thinking, we, oh, back. we have a chance to wait. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Must be thoughtful. <laughs> to model, exactly yeah. what Paul's just Well, just I, I was going to say, those of you who've only asked one question, we're actually doing really well on time so that we will um, give you, those of you, yeah, like you, Rob, uh, <laughs> we'll give you um, uh chance to ask another question if you want to be thinking of one and then as we have some air time I think I'll just make a few out of Eden Learn announcements to our, to our group okay. um, for those of you who've been with out of Eden Learn before you may have noticed a few little differences on our website uh, we have just had some kind of maintenance work done it should be um, quicker and zippier um, the student notifications for those of you who have students um, with their own accounts, we've tried to improve that so that when they log on, it should be blindingly obvious when they log on that there's a message waiting for them. Because um, we'd really like to um, make sure we've got as much dialogue going as possible within the community. Mm -hmm. um, what other announcements can we share, Shay? Do you want to talk about analog? Sure. Yeah. So this is a really exciting piece um, that we've been working on all summer, and we've just shipped it out. And that is out of even learn in paper format and analog in an analog format. And we'll be piloting that this fall in Cameroon at a local school in, in Cameroon. So that's really exciting. Yeah. And the purpose of that is that we do have schools who want to participate who li who literally don't have the bandwidth. And rather than give a cut, we looked into doing. Um, a cell phone version where it would be um, a greatly reduced format, we felt we wanted them to, to really have a beautiful experience mm -hmm. similar to what people with full bandwidth have. And so Shay has done a magnificent job putting together a beautiful um, paper version of Out of Eden Learn. Yeah. Looks Paul, like Paul's back. We were ad-libbing there, giving some updates. So, um, um, yeah, Nancy's talking to about, about connecting that. people and the connection breaks. <laughs> <laughs> It's technology's fault. <laughs> no, so that I was, I was just wrapping up, right? Time. I'm sorry, we should probably go ahead and move forward. Okay, so let's give Rob a chance yeah. to ask another question from one of his students in Chennai, India. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. Um, Paul, you're very well traveled as a journalist. Uh, what part of your journey are you most looking forward to and why? Is there a particular country or region that you're looking forward to? Yeah, Rob, absolutely. Um, there are three huge kind of um, uh, regions, political, geographic, social, cultural, that I've never been to. 
um, that I'm really excited because it'll be my first time. One is your neck of the woods, India. I've only been to Bangladesh, that's the closest I've been. Um, the other is China, uh, which of course is hugely important uh, in uh, world history and current events. And then the third is Russia, uh, walking up through Siberia. So those will be all new experiences for me. Looking forward to those. Great. And then, um, Poppy, did you have another question? Am I on? Yep. Um, according to my last year experience, uh, Paul, uh, my students uh, consider you as a hero. In their eyes, they're young students. Uh, how, how does that make you feel? And if it is an extra motive for you to keep going and sharing stories? Yeah, well, it's, it's, Popey, it's very humbling. I certainly don't consider myself a hero. Um, I don't, I never set out to do anything heroic. Um, strangely, you for know, one of the Young students, you are a hero. Oh, well, good. Well, that's, that's great. You know, what, what, I, what I would tell them is that what I'm doing is something that's, um, that they can do in, in, in a smaller way around their neighborhood, around the school, which is just be curious about the world. Um, that's all this is. This is a giant playground. My playground is 22,000 kilometers wide, but it's still a playground. And to go out and engage in a, in a, in a, in a way to learn about the world, but in a playful way, um, is one of the secrets, I think, of to continue learning our whole lives. Their, their input, Poppy, and, and the, the questions that Aziz and I are hearing tonight and the energy that we're getting from the kids, you know, I think I speak for maybe, I'll speak for myself, but you probably feel it too, is really hugely motivating. It really, it makes me feel good. It, it makes me feel like um, education is becoming more and more an important part of this project um, and maybe even more important than my writing in the sense that it has a lasting effect. If, if we can um, get people, in this case, your students, um, to be thinking about how to move through the world in a more thoughtful way, in a way that's where there's closely watching the world, observing, listening, um, increasing the net volume of empathy in the world, that would be a huge um, reward for me. So it's very, I'm very gladdened. My heart just uh, is very big to hear about your students' admiration. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Z. That's great. Um, Matt, do you have another question from your students you'd like to share? We do, and it's kind of on that hero line. I'm sorry, Natalie. Um, I said Matt. We're going to do Matt. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, sorry. Matt. Okay, on. We know your nickname now, anyway. Matt. Is this yep. working? Okay. Yep. All right. So um, our fifth grade classroom is having a hard time getting connected, and I wanted to make sure that the students had their chance to answer their question. You can answer their questions. Uh, it's it's uh, two unrelated questions. One is, do you celebrate your birthday, Paul? And the second is, uh, are there any places that you've gone to that you, you really think about wanting to return to another day? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, on the first one, you know, officially, no. Officially, I've, I've never really been a birthday observer, um, even as a kid growing up. But I like to think um, that every day I wake up um, healthy on the trail is a birthday uh, worth celebrating. And then the second, yes, there are, you know, there are not just places that I would want to go back to, but even more important, Matt, there are people I would want to go back to. Uh, and they're all along the trail. Absolutely. Every country I've been in, there are, there are people who become very dear to me. Uh, Aziz is one of them. He's become like a brother. Um, and I think that, again, I've, I've written about this, but I'll repeat it, is, you know, I'm not really walking to places, and I'm walking to people. And in my memory, when I think about when people say, what, were the, what was your favorite country? I can answer superficially about landscape and, and, and the food and, and whatnot, the music, um, but it's the people that I remember the most. And there are many in the Caucasus, um, in Turkey, in Israel, in Palestine, 
in Jordan, in Saudi Arabia, in Djibouti, in Ethiopia, here in Uzbekistan, in Kazakhstan. I mean, there's, there's, there are people in each of those countries that I still stay in touch with and I, I would love to go back and see them. Thank, thanks so much. I'm actually going to ask um, a question that came from your colleague, Kristen. Um, um, and this is for Aziz. What do you do as Paul's guide and is it difficult? Well, sometimes uh, you see Paul is not a tourist, my experience. Of course, I work with different uh, groups of people, but Paul, a uh, scientist, he's a writer. And sometimes uh, we have uh, and issues which uh, wasn't uh, resolved before. It is something uh, unusual for me and uh, something which uh, makes me uh, curious as well. And uh, I have all uh, uh, all will to make it happen. Well, there 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 is a sum, but. Uh, all has a resolution, all has a resol res resolution and we always find some solution. One of the things that Aziz has to do over and over, the poor guy and everybody who walks with me is do the elevator speech about what we're doing there, right? Imagine that, right? Every village you walk through is like, okay, we have walked from the Kazakh border and this guy has walked all the way from Africa and maybe 10 more seconds, and then say, hey, where can we get a cup of tea? <laughs> well, we have to understand people. Of course, they're interesting, and they uh, don't know who, what what we're doing and who we are. That's why you have to be polite and diplomatic. Honest, yeah. Mm -hmm. And Aziz is very diplomatic. Great. Thank you. And here's a question from Mike McFarland's fifth grade class in Chicago. When Paul finishes the walk, will he want to move outside of the U.S. because he has seen so much? What do you think, Paul? Um, I don't know, you know, honestly. My family is in the U.S. Um, I have many, many friends in the U.S. I was born in the U.S. But, you know, I, I left the U.S. very young when I was six. And, of course, I came back to study uh, secondary school and college. I, you know, I left again. I've, I've been bouncing around the world so much um, that, you know, I honestly don't know. The answer is I don't know. It's too far ahead. I'm still thinking about getting to some Markan. You have a long way to go before you have to decide. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Natalie, do you want to bring a student up? All right. Yes. Is Lenin known as a hero in Russia? Because in your article, I saw a statue of him. <laughs> Today, yeah, it was with Vladimir Lenin. Mm -hmm. Is Lenin known as a hero? Yep, yep. I'll let Aziz answer this one. Well, that's, uh, his name is uh, Vladimir, and he is an ex-pilot. Very interesting person. He uh, flew for something like, 30 years and when it came to uh, be retired and his aircraft uh, also supposed to be terminated he decided to cut his aircraft himself and he used parts of his aircraft at his house his house uh, looks like a museum he has different parts of aircraft he has old Soviet uh, vehicles uh, caterpillars and uh, he also very good hunter. He also very good uh, psychologist, and uh, he knows the environment and area very well. It was very interesting to travel with him. And uh, at the night, he gave us a little bit of uh, uh, knowledge about the stars. Uh, he pointed uh, different stars and. Uh, tell the name of the stars and uh, looks like without any GPS, without any uh, devices, you can just use stars to identify where to go and where to at. What do you think about Vladimir? 
No, it's the same. That's that's that's, that's Vladimir. That's the the man in the picture with the with the statue of Lenin. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that's. I think she was asking, what, what is the opinion of Lenin himself? Like, is he a hero? And that's well, a, that's a complicated question. As you know, yes, everybody this, would have a different answer. I think here. Well, he is a creator of the Soviet Union. Uh, Soviet Union uh, was created by Lenin, and uh, you know the role of the Soviet Union in the world history. Some people will say that is the positive role, some people will say it's a negative role, but still some heritage of the Soviet Union. Look at the, both Koreas, uh, two countries, uh, they divided, and uh, one is one has communistic, communistic regime, another one has uh, uh, different uh, de democracy and uh, difficult to say. Of course, he did good things and bad things, but you see, it's not much time passed. Some people still still has followers here, mm -hmm. and he's still icon for many of people. Uh, well, the uh, American writer uh, Theodore Dreiser, if I'm not mistaken, who visited the uh, Kremlin. And we met with uh, Lenin. He said, uh, "All what uh, he's trying to do is just a utopian." Mm. Utopian. Utopian. Yeah. Guys, we're nearly up for time, and I just want to sneak in two last questions. One has come in to us from Portland, Maine. Michelle Amato's class. Um, what is on the wall behind you? We were hoping you would ask that. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, as you would be better able to describe this. This pottery. is uh, this is plate uh, made from uh, ceramic ceramic plate made uh, in Fergana Valley. We have actually more. It's only one which you're able to see. There is some more on top. Well, you see, uh, Uzbekistan located on the. Silk Road, and during the trade with China, when Chinese pushed forward their goods to Europe, uh, the porcelain was one of the uh, important uh, products, trade goods. Yeah. Trade good. And uh, in the small city, Rishtan, in Fergana Valley, people tried to copy them. And uh, they copied for centuries and centuries until they uh, created their own style. And that is the Rishtan style. So very famous uh, in Uzbekistan and uh, in Russia and uh, neighborhood countries, Rishtan uh, ceramic. We'll be trying to share some of this culture with you guys in some upcoming dispatches. So keep an eye on the dispatch page. Mm, wonderful. Great. And then, um, we feel like we should let Tabitha, one of Tabitha's students, have the last word, and then we'll say goodbye and um, look forward to sharing this video with our community. Okay, um, we have a lighthearted question here for you both. All right. Uh, do you listen to music while you walk? If so, what kind of music do you like to listen to? Mm -hmm. yeah, that's, a, that's another good one. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll answer and then I'm going to very quickly and I'll let Aziz answer too because he's introduced, Aziz has introduced music in an unusual setting, mainly underneath railroad bridges where we're taking a, a break from the heat of the day. Um, Aziz has been playing a little music. Um, normally I don't, um, partly because I'd, it's not because I don't want to, but I have to limit what I carry and I don't want to carry batteries and I don't want to carry too much equipment. So I generally don't. I listen to the sound of the earth. That said, when I'm writing, when I'm in a place like this where I'm stopped and I'm at a, you know, at a table, I sometimes listen to music and it's all over, the, all over the map, literally. It could be Mexican ranchera music, it could be African, it could be Congolese music, um, it could be classical, um, it could be a pop. Um, with an unhealthy reliance on 1980 pop, I must admit. Um, but it's easy, you played some beautiful. <laughs> I'm betraying my age to you guys. Um, you've played beautiful classical music and some Russian composers. No, it wasn't Russian. Well, Russian-American. 
Italian. 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 Spectre. Yeah. Regina Spectre. Yeah, yeah. Ludovica Enaudi. So. What instrument do you play as you? Uh, do you play Me? Unfortunately, no. But my kids, they are musicians. Well, uh, when we are uh, walking, I want to get my head, uh, headphones and uh, listen to music, but uh, I need to uh, listen to uh, Paul, and that's why I'm always uh, in a steady mood. And uh, I know that when you're traveling, when, you, when, when you're walking, uh, especially on the, when you see beautiful nature, and if you will listen beautiful music, it will even... Uh, give more impression but uh, I'm not doing that because uh, I need to listen uh, environment I need to listen what Paul may say and uh, always need to be steady, steady re re ready to react well, I think that's but a cool note to finish on yeah um, thank you so much for anything for for going to great efforts really to to be able to connect with us um, and this is a very great impromptu event I think um, and thank you to all our educators both for for joining us now but for the work that you're doing <laughs> day in and day out with the with the kids which is really inspiring for us for Paul and and I think for an increasingly large audience so thank you thank you to the students who had all of these fantastic questions you guys rock thank you so much. Yeah, thank, you for, thank you guys. Thank, thank you. you. It's been a great night. Let's do this more often. That sounds good. We hope so. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Goodbye. Bye-bye.